I think fundamentally what youth brings is a certain element of joy, a certain element of playfulness. Uh, and this idea that, again, don't take yourself too seriously if you're a luxury brand. You are here to entertain, to educate, to surprise and delight. This is The Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast, which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Safari. This is Morty Singer, and we're in April, and it is starting to get warmer, and the world is spinning again here in April 2021. And today, I have Erwan Ramburg, who's been a top-ranked financial analyst covering the luxury and sporting goods sectors for 15 years. And after eight years of marketing at the likes of LVMH and Richemont, um, he's now a managing director of one of the top banks in the world, but he's also written um, two books. And these two books, quite famously, The Bling Dynasty, which was his first book, which analyzed uh, the reign of the Chinese luxury shopper. Um, this is now you know, seven years ago, so he really saw this consumer being incredibly important. And the latest book, The Future, it's called Future Lux, uh, What's Ahead for the Business of Luxury, which came out in October 2020. So he's a thinker. He's a thinker on all things uh, luxury, brand, global um, and has a really fun perspective. So stick around. Erwan, thank you so much for doing the safari with me. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So we find ourselves uh, at the tail end of the, at this recording, uh, hopefully the tail end, at least in the United States, um, of a uh, of a crazy uh, pandemic. Uh, at this recording, uh, it is April of 2021. Uh, some people are calling it... Uh, Q6 of 2020, but nonetheless, we are keeping the ball moving and, and there seems to be the spring time not only in the air, uh, but we are also looking at businesses and the world turning as well at the same time, which is exciting to see. So um, for the listener, um, I did a brief introduction already, but g explain uh, your area of focus and uh, maybe in particular, a little bit about your two books, one of which was quite prophetic, and I'm sure the second one will be as well. Let's hope so. Uh, so listen, I'm a, I'm a French national. I grew up in, in the US uh, and basically I've been involved one way or another with uh, luxury companies for the past 25 years. I used to work at LVMH in Richemont in marketing functions. And after eight or nine years of that, bizarrely joined the bank um, as an equity analyst, um, covering mostly luxury, uh, but more broadly consumer uh, companies out of Paris, London, Hong Kong, and now New York. Uh, so I've been doing that for 15 years. The first book was called The Bling Dynasty, um, and it was basically about the future of Chinese luxury consumption. That was about six years ago. Uh, the new book is called Future Lux, and that's a lot broader, a lot more holistic. And it's basically about um, the growth of the luxury industry post-pandemic. So, I mean, to your point, we're here based in the U.S., hoping that that light at the end of the tunnel is not another uh, train that's about to hit us. I think it's quite different in Europe. Uh, it's quite different in Asia, but yeah, we are seeing the end of this, uh, and we have already seen a pretty massive rebound uh, in terms of growth for the industry. So, tell me, Erwan, there is a um, there was a lot to cover. Quite frankly, I mean, there's obviously a lot of um, the, the the youth that is driving the luxury industry, indeed the consumer brand industry, uh, but also uh, there are elements of inclusivity of gender, sexuality, globalization um, that has caused the luxury brand, and let's just say brands, quite frankly, it's it's all brands, to really get young quick. Yep. And those who are unwilling to move and those who are unwilling to hire young designers or do collaborations or understand the influencer world or get on TikTok um, find themselves quite 
precipitously uh, out of favor uh, in a way that probably none of them on the board of those companies would ever quite imagine how quickly. Um, right. how, how are you sort of, let's say, from 30,000 feet looking at some of the key buckets or areas that are really you know, important, maybe by being missed by some, uh, and that are sort of the awakening of the brands that needs to follow the awakening of the consumer. Um, so I, I think I'm a, uh, I'm an optimist, uh, and I'm, I, it's probably the fact that I've lived in the U S for, for quite a while. Um, I tend to see silver linings pretty much everywhere. And so in any crisis, I think it's uh, an opportunity to reset and to, to basically focus on the positives, uh, and to make progress. And I think for years, there was this idea that some brands were, you know, developing products in a sort of ivory tower and being quite remote from um, the communities they were selling to. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity to become more intimate, to become more knowledgeable about who you're actually selling to. And to a certain extent, to accept that uh, the, the people who make up your company need to mirror somewhat the communities you're selling to. So you're talking to gender, you're talking to youth, um, you're talking to diversity and inclusion, um, you know, and you, you've had a lot of uh, sort of pretend approaches. And, you know, now that we've lived through a very difficult era, um, it's pretty clear that you're not buying brands just for a product or a logo. You're buying brands for purpose. You're buying brands because they speak to your community. Uh, they get it uh, and they've been involved. And so I think this, you know, crisis era, this pandemic uh, has actually taught brands to, you know, to wake up somewhat and to uh, take into account who they're selling to uh, and the reality that they need to be closer to that person. The irony is that, you know, four or five years ago, a lot of uh, people looking at the sector were convinced that um, youngsters would have limited interest for luxury. And it's exactly the reverse that's happened, you know, because I think you're looking at a young generation who's spending eight, 10, 12 hours a day on their devices uh, the image that they project is absolutely paramount uh, and they want to make sure that they're seen with the appropriate brands and the brands that tell a lot about who they are. Got it. So um, talk to me a little bit about the the the, the Asian consumer because you know, your first book, Bling Dynasty, um, I called it prophetic earlier, but you know, quite frankly, everyone had an idea uh, that China was going to be important. Um, indeed, you know, there were uh, quite famously the BRIC countries and for the last decade. But nonetheless, uh, how important the Chinese consumer, the young, affluent Chinese consumer would become uh, to our industry today, uh, no one could have, I think, quite understood. Uh, you were focusing on it very early on. So talk to us about that book and, and, and about what's different about that consumer that is different to the Western uh, consumer that we're used to. And indeed, the youthful Western consumer that we think we used to and understand. Yeah. So I think the timing of that book was quite interesting because it came right after the the, uh, the anti-corruption campaign where basically Xi Jinping started to uh, make a few speeches to make it clear that he would go after what he called the tigers and flies, you know, you know small corruption and then, you know, broader um, misbehavior. Um, and so you had a lot of comments then saying, ooh, this might be the, the beginning of the end um, of Chinese luxury consumption. And obviously it wasn't. You know, I think um, it did take out um, you know, business to business driven uh, purchases and somewhat male driven purchases. Uh, it affected some subsectors such as watches, for example. Uh, but actually now we're looking at a pretty, um, you know, pretty healthy uh, business where you're buying for yourself, not for gifting. Um, and I think the fundamental difference, um, and to your point, the Chinese have become quite dominant. You know, Chinese uh, pre-COVID accounted for about 40% of sales in the sector and 70% of growth. So clearly, uh, the most important uh, nationality around. Um, I think the key difference is essentially youth uh, and this idea that you're looking at almost pure recruitment in the sense that it's not about repeat purchases. It's about your capacity as a brand to bring in more uh, consumers, more bodies, if you will, um, into uh, the pyramid of luxury and eventually to hope to trade them up. But the the battle today is still about recruitment. The battle today is still about uh, appealing to that first time purchaser um, and she is very young. Uh, and because she is very young, she is very plugged in. Uh, again, she's spending a lot of time online. Uh, she's influencing other parts of society. 
Um, and I think it's youth uh, essentially that keeps the brands uh, on their toes and that enables them to actually go along a learning curve, which is very steep. Uh, you know, you have to move quickly in China. Yeah. And so when you, when you translate that into some of the, let's say, wholesale shifts that are happening um, in the psychographic of the young consumer, I mean, casualization, social media, uh, of new values-based economy. We call it the mindful economy. Uh, we even call yeah. it the pagan consumer. We headed a report four years ago called the pagan consumer. Um, how does that um, that change? Because there are some who would say, you know what, in the 60s, everyone had you know values as well, and then they all had kids and had responsibilities, and they all grew up. I think it's different this time. Um, every you know, generation has had that sort of feeling. But this time, these young people have a megaphone uh, attached to each one of them, which I think is one of the biggest you know, reasons why it's a little different. And they're actually educating up uh, to their generations above them. Um, but how does that casualization, as you call it, um, impact the whole luxury industry when in luxury is that, you know, sometimes historically anything but casual? Yeah, I think it goes to the point of don't take yourself too seriously as a brand. You know, what is your function? What is the function of luxury? The function of luxury for me is basically to put a smile on your face, you know, uh, and it's basically to change your outlook on the day uh, if ever for some reason you didn't start your day right. So for me, if you look at the different points that you're mentioning, casualization, I mean, I often get the question around, um, you know, is this a fad? How long is it going to last? And obviously, um, that question fails to understand the the principle that it's a generational shift. It's not about uh, you know suddenly because of COVID or even pre-COVID people were um, dressing in a bit more of a relaxed way. It's just that they're a lot younger, right? So you know you go to China and you go around and visit stores of Ferragamo, for example, and you know you realize that they're not selling ties, and then you understand why because you've been in business meetings all week and you never met a guy wearing a tie. It's just the way it is. Um, digitalization, I mean, it's, you know, this idea that even if you're not going to sell everything online, you're, you know, your first point of call will be blogs, forums, and, you know, chat with your friends. And uh, that's, that's probably going to be the first uh, step to discovering the history of a brand and to, to start to build that relationship. And then, you know, what you're mentioning in terms of values, clearly, you have to deal with cultural sensitivities. You know, there are certain elements uh, that youth in the US here or in China will be very uh, sensitive to, and you have to understand it. Uh, you have to, again, be part of the community. I think fundamentally what youth brings um, is a certain element of joy, a certain element of playfulness. Uh, and this idea that, again, don't take yourself too seriously if you're a luxury brand. You are here to entertain, to educate, to surprise and delight. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I you know, it's that's that's what you're you're around for. Yeah, I, I think you you you, sort of, you touched on as well this notion of storytelling and how I think brands feel that still traditionally that they have the microphone, um, and the way to you know become cool is to collaborate with um, amongst brands, whether it be mm -hmm. Gucci, whether it be Gucci North Face, etc., which is obviously great and it's been happening for quite some time now. Um, but I think you, the point you you also make um, is about the consumer uh, having the microphone and talking amongst themselves. I mean, the conversation happening out of the control of the brand, which control being obviously a narcotic that every business tries to keep. Yeah. Um, uh, you, one has to have a certain level of um, trust in one's consumers to take the narrative and then weave their own story with your brand. Yeah. Is that sort of where you're going with that? Yeah, I think the there's this traditional idea of storytelling, which is very much top down to your point between the brand and the consumer. And where it becomes incredibly powerful is when storytelling is indeed amongst consumers. So it's, you know, what you're able to tell your girlfriend or your buddy about your experience of this or that product or this or that brand. And real influence comes at a micro level. Uh, you know, that's where you really get the element of trust. And so you've had a lot of debates around brand ambassadors. You know, do you need another Kardashian or, you know, can you go to something that's a bit more local? Um, and it, it also goes to the point of, you know, a, a very, again, intimate relationship. I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive, but COVID enabled you to get closer to consumers, enabled you to go back to the roots of luxury, which is give me that emotional, intimate, non-substitutable relationship. 
Uh, and that's why I think at the end of the day, when the world reopens, which is to your point happening uh, soon, hopefully now in the US, uh, brick and mortar will be key because that'll be one place of clearly uh, physical, direct, intimate location, uh, you know, uh, relationship building. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I um, there's a term that I, I learned from some guys at LVMH, which I love uh, because it's it's sort of almost a ridiculously fancy way of saying word of mouth, um, which is quality hyper efficiency. <laughs> the idea being that if you have such a good quality product that all your clients are going to love it so much, they're going to tell all their friends about it, and therefore your yeah. The hyper efficiency of your future customer acquisition is obviously uh, uh, lowered because, well, it's heightened efficiency, but lowered cost um, because of how many people talk about you when you're not in the room. Um, and so I think one of the things that we focus on in Trab Capital is enthusiast businesses, people, uh, clients who love the enthusiast, either an activity, uh, a sport, a way of life, that they become the evangelists for the brand. Yeah. The brand has to be great. but And then, you know, the famous LTV to CAC story, uh, you know, if you can have a heightened LTV and lowered CAC, that's the, the, the nirvana of the business that we're in, um, which I think you're sort of hitting on uh, on all cylinders. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, I think we're talking more and more, you know, if you look at retail, we're, we're talking less about metrics such as like for like growth and more about net promoter score and how indeed um, consumers influence each other. And if you have phenomenal uh, experiences within a brand, then indeed word, word of mouth goes pretty quickly. I mean, the, the viral aspects of things, it works both ways. You know, you have a reputational risk on the negative and then you have the viral, you know, uh, obsession on the positive. If you're able to connect with certain communities, that that can spread pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. and you know, speaking of uh, sort of NPS being the new sales per square foot, which I couldn't agree more on. Um, how how do you um, view retail? You you touched on it a second ago, but you know, you I think you you have a chapter which is brick and mortar is immortal uh, in your book and. Uh, this notion, as we define it, that retail, what is the media value of retail? Right? If you have a store that's beautiful, that's that's something that people can talk about, suddenly it becomes a billboard that is an interactive billboard. Um, and therefore, with e-commerce and omni-channel, suddenly you have the right billboard with the right environment, and suddenly you're you're getting omni-channel retail. It's, it's not rocket science. It's quite hard to pull off actually because there's lots of moving parts there from design and and experience and hospitality and technology and all the rest of it but um if you can touch on it i, I think i'd love to get your so expanded view um on brick and mortar is immortal because i i couldn't agree more yeah i i, I think i think you're right in saying that uh, brick and mortar stores are the best substitute to traditional media um, and, you know, pre-COVID, about 10% of your sales, if you were a luxury company, were online. Post-COVID, it's pretty much doubled. So everyone's pretty much at 20, 25%. I think there's a cap, actually, to where that will go, simply because, again, I think luxury will remain a recruitment market for quite a, quite a while, meaning that the vast majority of your sales are going to be triggered by first-time purchasers, not repeat purchasers. Um, and so your store will fulfill a lot of different functions. So again, not just selling stuff, you know, basically education, entertainment, um, surprising you. Um, and, you know, and it, selling stuff in a store needs to be an afterthought. And, you know, uh, I think Nike does it very well at having, you know, a, a show on, uh, on a permanent basis in the store. And at the end of the day, you know, if you like the shoe that you just tried on, they could ship it at home. It doesn't really matter where you're buying it. What matters is what you're going to tell your buddies about the, the time you spent there. Um, and so I think, again, um, brick and mortar is immortal in my view, but obviously the store of tomorrow will, will have little to do with the store that you saw pre-COVID because I don't want to have the illusion of deja vu. I don't want to think that, this store in Soho or Fifth Avenue or Madison or whatever reminds me of another store of that same brand. Of course, I have to recognize the brand, look and feel the architecture, et cetera, but give me something I haven't seen before. That's what I'll pay for. Yeah, and so when you when you take that and then you also sort of wrap that in the riddle of, of, of the illusion of scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. This notion that an industry that has been based off of exclusivity is suddenly trying to be inclusive. So the question, I guess, is exclusivity versus inclusivity 
discuss? I mean, how do we, how do they pull off both? So I think, um, you know, Vuitton was hit first, I would say, seven, eight years ago by issues of ubiquity. I was Hong Kong based at the time. And I got a lot of mainland Chinese consumers who were telling me off, I've seen this brand too much. I'm fed up. It's a brand for secretaries. You know, it had become incredibly ubiquitous and it was to a certain extent off-putting. And I think the the way Vuitton and then most of the other big brands addressed it was by hyper-segmenting everything, hyper-segmenting product. You know, Vuitton used to be essentially known for monogram handbags. Now it's the Capucine, now it's entry-level pochette, it's... Um, you know, it's it's incredible how they've managed to continue to sell to millions and actually, you know, double sales since, you know, seven years, uh, but make you feel like you're the only consumer there. Um, same in terms of PR, same in, in, same in terms of retail experience. The idea is Vuitton eventually in Asia um, developed bigger stores to accommodate for the uber wealthy, you know, Hong Kongese Tai Tai who's been, you know, shopping there for 15 years, but also for the up and coming 22 year old who's discovering the brand for the first time. Um, so everyone being able to experience um, a, a phenomenal, uh, you know, time at Vuitton, um, despite, you know, catering to completely different needs, completely different consumer profiles. So it's all about hyper-segmenting the offering. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when you think about platform companies. I mean, there, there are those that talk about, you know, the Fortune 5 versus the Fortune 500, which are all the big, large technology companies that have more than a billion users each. And then each of those companies, whether it be Google or Microsoft or Facebook, they drop a line into their consumers with a new product. And the, the consumers, if you have the customer, then you can sell them new things. I would say that Vuitton is, or LVMH is probably the first and maybe only platform company uh, within the luxury space. Um, yes, there's Richemont and Caring, and I think they're wonderful companies, but to be able to now bre- you know, break out of, call it traditional brand retailing and add hospitality uh, as yeah. well, you know, and have, you know, Cheval Blanc that's opening, I think, next month in Paris and then beyond and buying, you know, big hotel groups um, is something that I've felt the industry, sort of retail hospitality, as it were, should have been doing more of, whether it be American department stores or whether it be other brands going into real estate, going into art, going into mm-hmm. private aviation. I mean, Harrods has a uh, an FBO, two of them actually, uh, outside of London, where they you know take care of everyone's private planes and fly them around and take their clothes, know what's in their closets. I mean, you know, it's kind of a an interesting uh, thing going on there. How do you see other luxury brands being able to follow suit uh, around the sort of the platformization of a powerful brand. I think it's the role of LVMH as the leader of the industry to redefine what that industry needs to be. Um, and I think they will continue to thrive to look at ways to basically penetrate the, uh, you know, the wealthy consumer's wallet in, in different ways. Um, and I think it goes to the point that um, you need to think in terms of budget competition. You know, the, the key competitor to Vuitton is not Gucci or Chanel. The key competitor to Tiffany is not Cartier or Bulgari. It goes way beyond that. Um, you have a lot of substitutes potentially. And so when LVMH develops into hospitality or into travel with Remova, for example, uh, you know, that might uh, have a few uh, raise their eyebrows. But the reality is, you know, if you leave aside you know, consumer electronics, essentially, there is no limit to what you can tap into in terms of that uh, um, that uh, wealthy individual's wallet. So I'm not sure other groups will follow suit uh, because LVMH has become so big. Um, you know, if you look at the market cap, if you look at the sales, if you look at the profits, uh, they're way, way, way ahead. I mean, you had a relatively balanced sector five, six years ago, and you could say, yeah, you have balanced groups between, you know, Richemont, Caring, LVMH, Swatch, and a few others. Now it's basically LVMH and the rest of the pack. And so where I think you'll see the most surprise in terms of redefining what luxury is supposed to be is likely going to be LVMH. And then you might have a few exceptions. So for example, Montclair likes to talk about new luxury, which is somewhere between a Nike and a Chanel. That sounds exciting. You know, they started with one small acquisition. Maybe they'll do a lot more in the future. But you have a few minds out there who are thinking very laterally. Um, But I'm not necessarily thinking that outside of those two, you'll have a lot of surprises. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. 
we pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage, and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. So coming back to your book for a second, um, <clears throat> chapter one is uh, The Future is Female. And mm -hmm. I think it's a, a wonderful place to start your book. And I think that it's a, a really interesting time in general, uh, which is not a blip. This is not a moment in time that will pass. This is obviously the foundational elements of a lot that will be built, not just on the consumer uh, as a female and her influence, but I think just as any female uh, in the workplace uh, and anywhere she chooses to, to be. Um, how do you see that um, truism that you have, uh, have put into the chapter, uh, how do you see that affecting not only the industry, but maybe even the men's business? Uh, you know, beauty is now extending into, uh, into the men's category for, as one example. But how do you see that statement, uh, the future is female, um, changing the next 10 years? You know, it's quite ironic because when uh, former colleagues in the industry read the title, they said, what are you talking about? The past was female and the present is female. Why, why are you saying the future is female? We're already there. I, I think what I meant to say is essentially, if you think about incremental spending, there's going to be an, an incredibly powerful combination of what the Japanese call womenomics, so hard data, uh, and uh, societal change that will lead to a sort of tsunami of spending from female citizens. So on the economic side, you basically have the reality of uh, salary gaps uh, hopefully converging. You have a participation rate in terms of employment, which goes higher, and you have a change in the, the family structure. You know, uh, getting married later, if at all, get, having kids later, if at all. Uh, and suddenly you're left with a, you know, a spending power, which is tremendous. And combined with societal change, you know, again, the silver linings um, of the sort of post Me Too era, where as a society, we understand that we need to give a, a, a much uh, uh, more, um, you know, prominent uh, place to women. And it's true in politics. It's true in uh, the economy. And it's true in the, in the business um, um, side of things. Uh, and so I think that combination will be incredibly powerful. It doesn't mean that male driven uh, subsectors will collapse. It's just that in terms of the incremental growth, measuring where, you know, where you'll get the best returns. You know, I, I'm thinking about jewelry, I'm thinking about cosmetics, I'm thinking about handbags and accessories. But on purpose in the book, I put the example of spirits, you know, which is traditionally seen as a macho or at least a male-driven industry, which will be incredibly driven by uh, you know, female um, um, enhanced uh, decision making. Uh, the influence will be tremendous, including on on subsectors which don't come across as being uh, female driven for now. So one of the one of the um, um, the pieces uh, that you also touch on is travel, and so that mm -hmm. that, that traveling female or frankly any consumer, um, the power of the traveling consumer as a um, as maybe a um, the crosshairs on that consumer indicate their disposable income. They're able to travel. They're able to take time off. Um, you know, I have a a lot of experience with one of the great, you know, companies in the world that that caters to that group, which is the the value retail team, Bista Village shopping collection in Europe and Asia, um, and they are at the crosshairs of hospitality, uh, retail, real estate, uh, excitement, and energy, um, and sort of delight that young customer to make their first ever purchase inside, um, effectively a luxury brand flagship boutique which you wouldn't expect to find in, a, in an environment that actually happens to be off price. I mean, it's stunningly beautiful and the fit outs are off the charts. But they're taking this young customer oftentimes into the brand for the first ever time, their first ever purchase of pick a brand. And so suddenly this traveling female affluent Chinese uh, consumer, uh, which is you know, a big part of their business, is sort of surprised and delighted. And speaking about CAC, uh, you know, that, uh, to lifetime value, the lifetime value of that customer is the rest of her life. Yet she's leaving, you know, Bista Village and going to back home to wherever she's from, and she's shopping the brand for the rest of her life. Um, how do you sort of look at travel um, 
and sort of square that into our industry because we talk about hospitality, but just travel retail and, and hospitality, and it's just becoming one big mashup um, and yeah. everyone, everyone duking out for the same dollar. So yeah. how, how do you how, touch on that? Because it was a big piece of your book. You know, it's interesting because you've had um, clear benefits of staycationing uh, during the, the height of the pandemic, where you've had uh, basically people stuck at home and not being able to spend on flights and uh, going to you know, fancy hotels and Michelin star restaurants and, um, you know, shopping uh, tours abroad, et cetera, et cetera. So there is this fear that when the world reopens, to your point, uh, discretionary income will be allocated to travel and stuff uh, will suffer. I don't think in those terms. I don't think it's an either or. I think that when you start to travel again or when you go back to nightclubs or when you go back to fancy hotels and restaurants, you'll want to look good as well. So for me, uh, the fact that the world reopens shouldn't come across as a big threat. It's it's a lot the way um, investors think. But if you speak to people within the brands, uh, for them, they're actually, you know, they're actually embracing, they're actually hoping for a world to reopen more quickly uh, than what we've seen. Yeah. So speaking of other places to spend one's money, um, you know, you talk a lot about the, the luxury of health and the trilogy of diet, exercise and sleep. Um, you know, and if you decide to sign up for one of those um let's call it concierge doctors and it's thousands of dollars a year or whatever it is, you're taking that dollar has been taken away from uh, someone, some brand or some expense. So do you, do you think that um, that will continue to be um, an integrated part of the luxury consumers mindset? And if so, do you think the big groups may end up trying to buy some of these health focused companies? Yeah, I think health and wellness um, has been front and center for a while. And obviously, uh, COVID, like for many other things, has been an accelerator. If you're living in the U.S. and you're thinking, oh, the administration's not taking care of me or my employer is not taking care of me, um, it's obviously quite different than if you're living in France and you think that both your employer and the administration will bail you out. So clearly, I mean, companies like uh, Lululemon or meditation apps, you know, uh, actually paying up to have Matthew McConaughey or John McEnroe help you fall asleep. It sounds crazy, but people do pay up for that. So it's true that then it's a question of allocation of resources, allocation of priorities. And, you know, the the impact might be eventually that if you're allocating more there, then you might be buying less, but buying better in luxury. I'm not too fearful in the short term, because for me, that will become an issue for luxury once you move to a repeat purchase market. But again, as I said, I think we're in the still in the infancy of recruitment for the time being. So I'm not, you know, I'm not losing sleep a lot uh, uh, around substitutes, but probably towards the end of the 20s, if I can put it that way, that those substitutes will will be a lot greater. And to your point, they might, uh, you know, prove to be um, investment opportunities for the current luxury groups that we know. And, and just finally, before we go into the final uh, round of questions um, on this sort of area, focusing on your book, you know, sustainability is obviously on everyone's lips and everyone's right to to do that. But if if to speak about that and and us chief among them and and many others who are our are, are respective colleagues, but I I think that one of the things that's sort of the elephant in the room of luxury uh, and beauty, for that matter, uh, and then travel. Uh, is is all those three things uh, the, the plastic from the beauty industry, um, the raw hides and, and leather consumption uh, and water consumption in, in yes the leather goods industry but also in the fashion garment industry, and then obviously the the idea of uh, private aviation and uh, and even just air travel in general being a, a carbon emitter. Um, can luxury truly look itself in the mirror, in your view? And say, you know, we can we can take a chunk out of it. We can we can do our best, but isn't there sort of um, a bit of a isn't the industry in general upside down on being able to fix it entirely? The consumers themselves have to make those decisions on some level as well. Yeah, but I I, I completely agree. But at the end of the day, the consumer decides, and you know, if the consumer decides that uh, that's what what she has as a priority, you better wake up. And I think. I think you're right in saying that um, luxury is incredibly late. I mean, if you look at some um, brands like Patagonia, they've been doing this for like 15, 20 years. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you go back to what um, former CEO at Hermes was saying, which is, you know, luxury is what can be repaired. Well, you know, hopefully we go back to that 
type of thinking rather than to the reality that, you know, the fashion industry is one of the most pollutive industries on the planet. Um, so for me, there is a value in extending the life cycle. There is a value in circularity. There is a value in using recycled or recyclable uh, materials. Um, I think the, the the real issue, and I, I get this cynical comment from some managers in the space saying, well, you know, who cares about the environment because the Chinese consumer is not asking. Well, she's not asking because she not because she's Chinese. She's not asking because she's a first time purchaser. But wait until she becomes a repeat purchaser. And it's not her first Vuitton, Chanel, Gucci handbag, but her second, third or fourth. Then you'll get questions that you're getting in the U.S. that you're getting in parts of Europe and you better be ready. And most brands are not ready, to your point. Yeah. I, <laughs> so COVID is a good time to get your act together. Yeah. And I think many of the brands um, and companies, forget brand, just anybody who's um, a, a small company, medium-sized company, think of themselves as one drop in the ocean and they, well, how could they possibly change anything? Well, you know, obviously an ocean is filled with many drops. And so if, if everyone does their little part, then um, I, I think it all, it all will, out, will add up. So as we, um, I know I could speak to you for another two hours, but so as we go uh, towards the end here, give us um, a few of the things that you think are most interesting to you over the next 10 years. Uh, maybe things that will influence Influence the industry, things that will be adopted by the industry, things that uh, maybe um, are just popping onto your radar now for people to think about. Um, to, to give us sort of the top few things that are on your mind. Well, I mean, the, the, the way I think about the next ten years is again a a, a massive rebound following uh, this uh, COVID episode. And to be fair, we're already seeing it yeah, um, in the, the the first few results that are coming out. What I'm seeing is a, a lot of consolidation M and A. You know, I think when you look at the LVMH Tiffany deal, a lot of people thought that this was the last deal in a decade. I think it's the first deal of an upcoming decade and a lot more coming because scale matters. It's a bit sad to say for the small independent guys, but unfortunately, I think you'll see uh, a lot more coming on the consolidation um, front. And then what I'm hoping for as a consumer myself is exciting stores. You know, give me a reason to get out of my home and to actually discover stuff and to mingle and to discover a story. Um, and so I think, you know, I think we will, um, especially here in the US where, you know, retail has been so incredibly uh, boring. I, as I said, I used to be based in Asia uh, and there's a lot more life and excitement there. And I think it's coming everywhere. Again, it's not because it's Asian or American, it's because it's youth. And as I think you mentioned before, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, daughters would look up to their moms to 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 figure out what, what's what's hip, what's cool, and now it's completely flipped. You know, now it's people our age <laughs> who are looking at our kids, thinking, okay, where where do I get the the next trend from, uh, and where do I get the next influence from? So I think there are a lot of exciting things to come in luxury. I think it was a pretty dull um, growth, you know, ten years ago because it was all about rolling out stores and everything looked the same. Um, so I tend to, to say that it looked a bit like the Space Invaders game, you know, pretty yeah. boring and systematic and black and white. And now it's, uh, you know, now it's um, more like Candy Crush and there's stuff happening all over the place. It's complex, it's difficult, but it's fun. You know, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to bring. There's a lot to reinvent in this space. And just to be clear, when you say our age, you mean 25? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah like 20 30 yeah, years exactly. more of thinking like exactly. a 25 year old there we go yeah. um well listen i i think that was really wonderful and i think there's a lot there is a lot of fun and the as, as they're now calling it the roaring 20s are um uh, absolutely uh on their way in and uh not not quick enough and um but this has been a really fascinating conversation i urge everyone to go and buy Future Lux, uh, as well as Bling Dynasty for that matter. Uh, and um, it's just been really, really fun. So um, Erwin Rumborg, thank you so much for joining me on the safari. Thanks a lot for having me. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time. <laughs>